and um, we'll uh, uh, welcome Ray McGovern for joining us. Let's see. And uh, I think many of you know Ray. He's a terrific guy, a wonderful peace activist, very knowledgeable about Russian affairs. And uh, he's also serves on the, among other things, on the advisory board of Veterans for Peace. He's a co-founder of Veteran and Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. And uh, he actually uh, speaks uh, fluent Russian, I understand. Is that right, Ray? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, I used to teach it, actually. Right. So wow. who's the only one that's not going to need the subtitles uh, when, we, when we hear from uh, uh, President Putin a little bit later? Uh, mm -hmm. And Ray, anything else you want to say in introducing yourself? Yes, I have to tell you that uh, I'm not very good around the house with the fixing things. And so that's a standard joke that my children and my wife say is, uh, yes, but, but he could speak Russian. <laughs> <laughs> so when I hear people say he can speak Russian, it's a sort of mixed blessing because it re reminds me of that not such kind sort of repost that uh, he can't do anything else, but he can speak Russian. Right. <laughs> that's all I have to add, Jerry. <laughs> I need something like that because I'm not very good at fixing things around the house either. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Ray. Well, the floor is all yours. We're gonna uh, we're gonna hear from you for 30, 40 minutes. You can take all the time you need, um, and then we're gonna have a question and answer and discussion, and uh, spend uh, the first hour or so of our our meeting, which we do. We meet we meet by this is the Nuclear Abolition Working Group of Veterans for Peace. We meet every two weeks. Um, the second and fourth uh, um, Friday of every, and then once a month, every other meeting, we have a guest speaker. Um, so uh, that's what we're doing today. And uh, the floor is all yours, Ray. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, before I forget to do so, I want to advertise this great product that you all put out. It's unique. It's helpful. It's a, an incredible resource. And to address uh, complex questions in this kind of holistic way is very refreshing. So my compliments to all of you who had a hand in this. Uh, one of my advantages is that I go back a ways. Um, I was actually among those students in grammar school who hid under their desks, lest the fallout from Soviet nuclear weapons contaminate us. I was of a generation where I lived in perpetual fear of that kind of thing. I used to walk down the streets of New York and they would be building a new tall building and I would say, don't they realize that just one miscalculation, not only that will be, they'll, they'll all be destroyed. So that's, that's the, the background that I came out of. And uh, for a lot of reasons, I decided to major in Russian in college, took my master's degree in Russian as well. Now, um, I was commissioned upon graduation uh, in 1961, and I entered on active duty on November 3rd, 1963. I had a year to complete my master's degree. Uh, November 3rd, 1962, that was the word, yeah, 62. Now, when I reported, I was an Army Infant Infantry Intelligence Officer, and when I reported to Fort Benning for the Army Infantry Officers School, which we had to go through, and then the Intelligence School later, uh, there were no weapons there. Now, those of us who were sort of gung-ho in those days had heard about this new weapon, a grenade launcher. Oh, a grenade launcher, oh, we're gonna play with that, right? Okay, there weren't any. There weren't any, any in Fort Benning. And so a couple of us discreetly inquired, uh, uh, Sergeant, <laughs> can you tell us where the weapons are? And he said, sure, they're all down at Key West. Two divisions came through here last weekend carried all those weapons off. 
the writer crossed from Cuba and Key West. November 3rd, uh, 1962. That's how close we were, folks. That's how close we were. Now, I was not yet in the Central Intelligence Agency. That came two years later. But I did learn rather quickly that we spotted those medium range and short range ballistic missiles in Cuba with our U-2s. We found them, right? And then we stopped them and John Kennedy turned, turned them around, okay? Yeah, right, okay. Uh, when John Kennedy asked his briefers, CIA and from defense, um, are those missiles loaded? Uh, do they have nuclear warheads on them? He was told, probably not. Uh, we don't think so. Um, the way they say it now is, we assess that there are no nuclear warheads on those missiles. Well, isn't that great? I imagine Kennedy being as smart as he was says, I don't give a rat's at a rat's patootie what you assess, I wanna know whether there are nuclear warheads there. Oh, well, we think probably not, okay? Probably not is not good enough. It took two or three, I think it was three decades for us to learn that those missiles were armed with nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons were on top of those missiles, okay? So when you go back to Cuba and there are analogies now, uh, you have to wonder about the intelligence and you have to especially wonder about people who say, well, we assess this, we assess that, and we assess the other thing. Now, uh, 1962, my career as an army officer ended two years later, November, 1964. And I became the chief analyst in the, in the CIA of Russian foreign relations with China. Uh, I later became the branch chief of the Russian or the Soviet foreign policy branch in those days. Now, that was really heady stuff. Lots of things were happening. And some of you know that when Kissinger and, uh, and Nixon uh, went to, or Kissinger first, and then Nixon went to Beijing, they turned the triangular relationship between the US, Russia, and China on its head. In other words, until then, the US was uh, pretty much in charge and Russia was uh, at loggerheads with China. Now we were in a race for good relations with the US. And in large measure, that accounts for the fact that in 1971, 72, we had an agreement on Berlin. We had an agreement on, uh, on all kinds of sticky issues that we could not agree on before with the Russians. Why? Because they were afraid that the Chinese would steal a march on closer relations with the United States. One of those issues was strategic arms. And uh, I had a very active branch in those days. Uh, I had three people that I seconded uh, to the start, the strategic arms limitation talks that uh, were in Helsinki and Vienna I had one on the delegation. I had one of my people in headquarters uh, with the military people. Uh, I had a, a, another, who was the other one? Uh, another place within the, within the apparatus writing up what was going on. And so when it came to the end of this negotiation and uh, we were very much involved, uh, we uh, decided, that is the negotiators decided that the best way to curtail the reality of people having to hide under their desks was to do an agreement that would preclude a first strike. Preclude a first strike, what does that mean? Well, uh, there was an effort to build anti-ballistic missiles and cooler heads prevailed and said, now look, uh, if there, if there were no anti-ballistic anti missiles, or if there were only one or two, uh, then neither side could think that they could actually do a nuclear strike without crippling uh, retaliation. 
And so those sensible people negotiated a treaty called the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the ABM, and that allowed initially for two such sites, two ABM sites. Uh, this would be no way to defend a whole country, of course. Later, they decided on one. Now, I was very proud to be part of, a, of an agency that when Nixon asked, uh, uh, if we trust, can you verify? <laughs> you know, the old, uh, doverai no proverai. That didn't start with, with uh, Reagan, that started with Nixon. And we said, well, how soon do you need to know if the, the Soviets are cheating? And uh, Nixon, um, two weeks? Yes, we can do that. And that was one chief enabling fact that we could conclude that treaty, persuade Congress to ratify it. And it was the cornerstone for stability for 30 years, count them, 1972 to 2002. Side note here, did the Soviets cheat? Yeah, they cheated. How so? Well, after we had reduced the treaty to one ABM site for each country, uh, we watched a long, big, enormous radar site go up in a place in Siberia called Krasnoyarsk, okay? It was the biggest thing you ever saw and it could only have been an ABM radar installation. So we called the, the Russians on them and said, what do you mean? So we showed them the pictures and we said, now tear it down, okay? okay? This was not the Berlin Wall, but it was Reagan saying, tear it down, tear it down this extra unauthorized uh, ABM site. So what happened? Well, the Russians said, no, it's not ABM, not ABM. They said that for six years. Now in the old days, <laughs> back in the day, we used to sit around a table and debate these things and show each other photographs and so forth like that. And so after six years, the Russians say, all right, okay, it was an ABM site, we're going to destroy it, and they did. What's the point of all this? The point of all this is that if you have strict inspection mechanisms, these treaties, these arrangements can indeed be verified and can be very, very tightly controlled. Now, that was back in 2002 that George Bush, in his wisdom, decided to scuttle this ABM treaty, which was the cornerstone for stability, uh, you know, without which you don't have any, any balance of, of the threat. Uh, and the Russians were, were amazed. Why did you do this? Well, no explanation. Uh, oh, and so Putin was watching as things progressed. And sure enough, a couple of years ago, not only the ABM treaty, but the INF treaty, the Intermediate, Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty was abrogated this time by Trump. Now, what was that treaty all about? This, this was abrogated in 2019, so not too long ago. Well, that treaty, my friends, destroyed a whole class of nuclear missiles with, with nuclear missiles, okay? A whole class, intermediate and shorter range nuclear missiles. Destroyed, what do I mean? Well, there were, S, there were S-20s in Russia and there were, um, uh, there were the equivalent of the name of the second you guys know it in, in, uh, in Europe. And we decided, well, let's, let's eliminate them. And then there, there won't be just 10, uh, 10 warnings, 10 minutes of warning. There'll be 25 as we used to at 30, 35. So uh, those, those missiles were all destroyed. And, and then when we got out of it uh, in 2019, the Russians were really, okay, well, What's what's going on here? What are the what is the U.S. military really trying to do? Now, in all this, um, in 2014, uh, we did a coup in Ukraine. You all know about that. If you haven't listened. You haven't watched it in the um, uh, in the New York Times because they never talk about the coup that we arranged in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, 
Putin um, was not about to let go of Sevastopol in Crimea, where their main ice-free um, naval base was located. Uh, the Crimeans voted to rejoin the Soviet Union, <laughs> rejoin Russia, and they did. Now, a month after that, Putin in, in a public speech said, you know, we had to accept Crimea's application to rejoin. We had to accept the notion that we would annex Crimea. We had to do that. And it was really not so much the fact that they wanted to join NATO. More important, Putin's words, more important was the possibility that Crimea would be used for the emplacement of ballistic missiles disguised as ABM missiles, but really uh, designed to strike strike uh, Russia. And the idea is, well, I'll tell you what, uh, I, have a, a, um, I have a video clip here of uh, Putin talking to Western reporters, uh, memory serves as 2016. And uh, he lays out his concerns to a rather sleepy, sort of complacent, oh, not interesting, and he loses it. And, and Putin doesn't usually lose it, but he does in this case. So I think that uh, as a background for those of you who are, who are not fully versed in all these uh, arcane things, uh, you can watch this. The subtitles I have verified are extremely accurate. And I'll just play it for 10 minutes and uh, then we'll resume the discussion. And I think I get an idea of what I'm aiming at because if you look at it, this, not Ukraine joining NATO, not going back to 1970, whatever, or 1997. No, what he's worried about is having only five minutes of warning time before a Tomahawk missile um, um, hits Russia. And the, the missiles that were destroyed were called Pershing twos, by the way, a uh, little, uh, little gap there in my mind. So if we could have that, uh, that video now, uh, it's 10 minutes, but I think it's worth this time. Get the sound on that, Helen. Yeah, we're not getting a sound. Can you rewind and get the sound? You you need to to stop the share and then start it again and set it so the sound works. Yes. Теперь по поводу про. Послушайте, вот здесь все очень взрослые люди и уже опытные. Мы с вами. Я сейчас не буду просить, чтобы вы это все вот так, как я скажу, отражали в своих материалах, влияли, влияли на на прессу там или как. Я просто вам, вот, знаете, хочу вам лично сказать, напомнить какие-то вещи. Ведь мир избавлен от крупномасштабных войн и военных конфликтов. Мы с вами все об этом знаем. Благодаря так называемому стратегическому балансу, который был достигнут после того, как две суперядерные державы договорились фактически о сдерживании и в росте наступательных вооружений, и о сдерживании в системах противоракетной обороны. Потому что для всех понятно, если одна сторона развивает противоракетную оборону 
успешнее, чем вторая, то она приобретает преимущество, и у нее появляется искушение использовать это оружие первой. Поэтому это один из краеугольных камней международной безопасности, система против, противоракетной обороны и договоренности в этой сфере. Я далек от того, чтобы кого-то ругать, обвинять в чем-то. Но когда наши партнеры американские вышли в одностороннем порядке, они нанесли колоссальный удар, по, или вот это был первый удар по международной, по международной стабильности с точки зрения возможности нарушения баланса сил стратегического. Тогда я сказал, ну мы сейчас не можем развивать эти, эти технологии, поскольку а дорого, во-вторых, еще неизвестно, как они будут работать. Мы не будем просто деньги полить. Мы пойдем по другому пути, мы будем совершенствовать ударные системы, чтобы сохранить баланс. Только для этого. И для того, чтобы угрожать кому-то. Нам ответили, ну да, это вот не, наша система ПРО не против вас, а то, что вы делаете, мы исходим из того, что это не против нас. Ну и делайте, что хотите. Я думаю, что вот такое столько вопроса, она связана с тем, я уже говорил, по-моему, сегодня на пленарном заседании, Связано было с тем, что это же начало 2000-х годов, Россия находилась в очень сложном положении. Развал экономики, значит, фактически гражданская война и борьба с терроризмом на, 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 на Кавказе, оборонная промышленность в развале, вооруженные силы в ужасном состоянии. Ну кому в голову приходилось, что Россия сможет наращивать стратегические вооружения? Наверное, думали о том, что... Пройдет некоторое время, имеющиеся, доставшиеся от Советского Союза вооружения будут деградировать. Поэтому надо сказать, да делайте, что хотите. Но мы предупреждали, что мы будем это делать. Мы сказали об этом. И мы делаем. И я вас уверяю, сегодня Россия добилась существенных успехов на этом пути. Я сейчас не буду всего перечислять, но мы модернизировали наши комплексы. И успешно развиваем новые поколения. Я уже не говорю о системах преодоления системы противоракетной обороны, но наши партнеры, несмотря на все наши возражения, на все наши предложения о реальном сотрудничестве, не хотят с нами сотрудничать, отвергают все наши предложения и действуют по своему плану. Я сейчас не буду, некоторые вещи считаю, даже пока некорректным говорить публично. Ну, можете мне верить, можете не верить. Мы предлагали конкретные элементы, конкретный вариант сотрудничества. Они реально все были отклонены. Но вот все-таки пришли к тому, что сейчас построили систему ПРО в, в Румынии. Говорили это все время о чем? Нам нужно защититься от иранской ядерной угрозы. Где ядерная угроза иранская? Ее нет? Договор подписали уже. И причем Соединенные Штаты были, по сути, инициаторами этого договора с Ираном. Мы помогли, мы поддержали. Но если бы не позиция США, не было бы этого договора. И это, безусловно, заслуга президента Обамы. Потому что я считаю, это договор правильный. A good uh, breaking point. Or yeah, that's uh, that'll be enough of that. I'm sorry that uh, there were technical difficulties there. We uh, got the point. Yeah, the um, you you recognize that uh, he's taking advantage of a group of Western journalists who happen to be in St. Petersburg uh, for an economic summit of some kind, and uh, he's trying to to get them to realize what the danger is. And uh, he starts out by saying, now, I don't expect you actually to write this up, what I'm saying, and <laughs> I don't even expect you to, to tell your editors that this is interesting, or maybe you will write about, no, I don't expect, I just want to talk personally to you and tell you, this is really important, this is a real danger. And what he says, and I'm sorry that didn't work very well, what he says is these so-called ABM missile sites that are going into Poland and into Romania are, uh, well, well, they're holes. Uh, they're uh, launchers that can easily accommodate what Putin calls 
Tamagoks, Tamagoks, Tomahawk missiles, okay? The Tomahawk missiles in those emplacements would threaten a good section of Russia's strategic retaliatory capability. So he's been harping on this, that's 19, that's 2016, way back to 2007, he harped on this. But as they started to go in in Romania and Poland, he really started creating a din about this. Of course, well, nobody reported this, nobody saw that in the newspapers, I thought this was very, very telling. He says, look, we know what the plans are. We have the Pentagon plans. We know exactly when they're going to replace these ABM missiles with Tomahawk missiles. We know what their range is. Uh, we know when they're going to do this and what stages. And and they know that we know. <laughs> so he's going, he says, you know, everybody knows what's going on here. And this is a real, real threat to the balance of power. The real threat to what had been stabilized, not only by the AM, by the ABM degree of 1972, but by the INF uh, treaty, which, uh, which destroyed the Pershing missiles and the SS-20s uh, in uh, 1987. So we had 30 years of stability, call it fear of, you know, fear of retaliation uh, from the ABM treaty. We had even more, 32, I think, last time I did the math uh, with the INF treaty. So what's, what is, uh, the, the Russian game now with respect to, to Ukraine. Well, um, the way the US and other Western countries are buttressing Ukraine and sending all manner of arms to Ukraine, uh, Putin is afraid that, uh, as he said, right after Ukraine was annexed, that the West will use, NATO will use Ukraine for emplacement of these intermediate range ballistic missiles, um, tomahawk box, if you will, and that they will endanger a good portion of Russia's strategic retaliatory force. And so uh, that, that seems to be important. As he says, I forget whether it was included. He says, you know, uh, that will reduce my, re my response time to seven to eight minutes. And if they're, as they eventually will be, hypersonic, and then that's five minutes. I don't want to be in a position where I have to decide to destroy the world in five minutes. Sensible? I think so. Sensible on a part of those who are placing these things? Not so much. The, the rainbow here, uh, the, the silver lining, if you will, is that Putin has made his point. And uh, I'd like to know if any of you know this, uh, Biden already has said that the U.S. has no intention of putting offensive strike missiles in Ukraine. How many of you know that? How do I know that? Well, I read the, the Russian press and when Putin told Biden, look, we have to talk. We have to talk on the telephone before our negotiators begin negotiating on the 10th of January. And on the 30th of December, uh, Biden said, okay, we called. And what Putin said is, look, I want you and me to be in charge of supervising these people very closely. And I'd like you to pledge as a, as a starter, not to, do you, do you in, in, intend to put offensive strike missiles in Ukraine? Biden says, no, 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 I have no plans. Okay, I want you to say that, okay? And the readout from the Russians is that that's what Biden did. How about the ones in Poland? How about the ones in Romania? Well, those are up for negotiation, but it looks like, well, it doesn't look like, we now have a copy of the US response. We call it a non-paper, okay? The non-paper responding to Russian demands. And guess what? The US expresses a willingness to talk about this and to include 
What? Inspection. On-site inspection. Transparency measures. So it sounds very much like the old INF. And uh, if the negotiators are working on that, uh, then that's something below the surface. It's not very much bandied about in the press, and that's a good thing, give the negotiators time. But when, when they come to some sort of agreement, which I believe they will, then, then Biden will be faced with the Mickey Mat, the military, industrial, congressional, intelligence, media, academia, think tank complex. Now, that's what the old MIC, the old military industrial complex that Eisenhower talked about, what it has grown into as top seed. And the key here is media, the middle M. Without the media, the complex doesn't work so well. And even Eisenhower, I don't know if you remember, but when he warned about this, what, 60 years ago or so, he said, look, the only thing that can defeat the military industrial complex getting too much power is an educated citizenry, a citizenry that has the facts and our citizens don't have the facts. That's why media is so key there. So let's see, uh, let me uh, just wind up with a couple of thoughts here. Uh, Macron, uh, the um, French president was in, was in Moscow on Monday and uh, <laughs> Putin and he talked for five hours, over five hours, and then they had a press conference. And what did Putin say in the press conference? Well, it's interesting. I'll quote him. I would like to remind everyone that our proposals to the United States had three points. NATO's non-expansion, non-deployment of offensive weapon systems near the Russian border, and turning uh, the infrastructure back to the 1997 level. In other words, all those countries that were admitted to NATO uh, sent them back out of NATO. Now I ask you, if you're a negotiator, okay? And you see Putin saying these three things. Does he expect NATO to sign a piece of paper that says, oh, no, 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 we'll never, we'll never let Ukraine into NATO? Of course he doesn't. What, why is he making that point? He says, I want a signed piece of paper this time. Because back in 1990, everyone knows we were tricked. We were swindled. We were screwed. That's what the Russian word means, okay? And how is that, of course? We were, we were reassured by uh, James, James, James Baker and Helmut Kohl and everybody and his brother that there would be no expansion of NATO one inch east of East Germany. So this time we want a written statement. We want a written statement. We want it signed and, and, and just legally binding. Now, does Putin, will he really fall on his sword for this? Does he really think it's, it's realistic? Well, what he really thinks is that a signed agreement means exactly what an ABM treaty does, what an INF treaty does. <laughs> Those are signed agreements. The US can just leave without explanation. So it's not the signed agreement. It's the propaganda. It's the public acknowledgement of, we were screwed back in 1990 because we didn't get a signed document. We just got our promises. That's not gonna happen again. Now, the main thing, which I've alluded to already, is the intermediate range nuclear weapons, now, as, he, as he characterized them, the non-deployment of offensive systems near the Russian border. Now, they're, they're talking about that now. And uh, as, as I said before, that's not very much in the news, but that's good news that they're talking about it. The other thing I'd simply add is that, uh, gosh, how do I say this? Uh, Biden is not looking but like he's very much in control. If, if you watched that NBC interview last night, you know, he's talking about Afghanistan and, uh, you know, well, the withdrawal. And, uh, and then he says, and you know, when, when we did finally withdraw from Ukraine, uh, I mean, uh, Iraq, uh, 
I mean, I mean Afghanistan. Well, you know, there's some real question as to his mental acuity. Now, that doesn't, it doesn't matter what McGovern thinks of Biden's mental acuity. What Putin thinks of it is very important. And so he's got to keep his powder dry because this man is unpredictable. He's yelling about, oh, uh, yep, I think the Russians are going to go in. And I said, could be imminent or maybe not so imminent. Uh, I mean, this is the guy in control. A subsection of that is, even if Biden were in control, Putin has learned from sad experience that the president of the United States could come to very sacrosanct agreements with Putin himself, and then the US Air Force will bust that agreement in nine days as they did as they did to the meticulously negotiated ceasefire in Syria when Air Force bombers killed 100 or so Syrian emplacements nine days after the ceasefire had been agreed to personally by Putin and Obama in that case. So, so there's a real, uh, real question as to how much trust Putin can put into Obama, even, not Obama, uh, into Biden, even if they agree on these things. Uh, what else? I, I think probably I'll, there are probably some questions that will arise now. I mentioned before that, uh, that this is pretty, this is elusive material. It's not all that clear that I've got the right line on things. I am happy to report that, uh, that Scott Ritter and I had another one of our uh, Lincoln Douglas uh, mini debates today, earlier in the afternoon. And that uh, Scott agrees with me that there's not likely to be a, an invasion by Russia of Ukraine. But, and everybody said, whoo, I said, no, 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 <laughs> don't relax. That just, that might just mean that we're both wrong. You know, that, that uh, you know, this is very elusive. Why are all those troops are around? But we think we know why. And we think we know that Putin is smart enough that he's not, that he's smart enough to avoid getting into a situation where he would have to deal with the consequences of invading Ukraine. So I'll stop there and I'll, I'll be happy to entertain or try to entertain any questions that you have. I'll get the ball rolling, uh, Ray. Well, you thank you very much. That's a very uh, fascinating um, presentation. You have been perhaps more optimistic than some, at least that the, there may be some meaningful negotiations going on regarding the nuclear missiles in Europe. And we know that both China and Russia now are calling for the removal of uh, nuclear weapons from Europe. Um, how do you think that the Veterans for Peace and the peace movement can, uh, what kind of stance and actions can we take at this time to encourage movement in that direction? Well, I'm, I'm not clear on how many uh, fraternal veterans for peace organizations we have in Europe. I know we have one in the UK, but I would think veteran to veteran uh, outreach might, might be helpful here. Uh, I know that in Germany, there are a lot of people that have their heads screwed on right mm -hmm. and might actually uh, cooperate with some sort of initiative to expose those nuclear bombs that are 100 years old or so and lying under German soil as Netherlands soil, as Turkey, and so forth. So that would be my only off the, off the cuff suggestion. Well, it's a good one. We do have uh, a number of veterans chapters, uh, international, including in, the, in, the, in Russia now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, veteran to veteran outreach, uh, uh, very appropriate, uh, particularly with our friends in the UK who are, uh, whose, whose government is uh, very much in lockstep with the US right now in terms of confronting Russia and blowing up this crisis. Uh, some people believe that the US is actually baiting Russia to invade Ukraine. You think there's people here in the US, some of the neocons who actually want to see war break out in Ukraine? Yes. 
the same <laughs> ones that were respect responsible for Iraq, for Afghanistan. The Mickey Met, of course, is power mind here, but there are uh, there are people like Victoria Newland, who is in large measure responsible for this whole thing, having orchestrated the U.S. supported coup in Kiev on the 22nd of February. I mean, that was the most blatant coup in history, properly labeled that by various people. Why so blatant? Well, for those who don't remember, uh, everyone was thinking, wow, there might be a coup in Kiev. And then on the 4th of February, 2014, there was a YouTube intercepted recording between Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland and the US ambassador in Kiev, Jeffrey Pyatt. And Nuland is saying, oh, they, oh, you know, Yats is the guy, Yats is we pick uh, the guy for who take over and let uh, the others uh, wait in the wings. And, and when we, when we uh, nail this thing down, uh, Jake Sullivan, who works for Biden, he says that Biden will come in and glue this thing together. Uh, what's that, Ambassador uh, Pyatt? What about the EU? <laughs> she uses the F word for the EU. Now, that shows what kind of sanction they have for the EU, but more important for my purposes shows that the conversation was genuine because the next day she was all apologies to the EU, uh, but she didn't apologize for the coup, which came on the 22nd. So do the math. The 22nd of February, 2014, minus four, which it was the fourth when the YouTube thing was. So what is that? 18, 18 days? So they had 18 days warning. I thought, wow, too bad for Yatsenyuk, the, the guy who was picked to be the prime minister. I mean, it never happened now. It's been disclosed on YouTube, but no, no. Uh, Newland made it stick. She's still around. And she brags about these sanctions from hell, okay? And she's really interested in stopping Nord Stream 2, which is the new pipeline uh, delivering gas and a little bit of oil uh, to Western Europe, $11 billion worth. And Biden, with, with the chancellor of West Germany standing next to him a week ago at the White House said, you know, well, you know, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna remember, do this from memory. If there will be, and where he says, if Germany, I mean Russia, invades the UK, <laughs> invades Ukraine, uh, and I mean tanks and troops, there will be, we, there will no longer be a Nord Stream 2. We'll bring an end to it. Question, but how will you? How will you do that exactly since the project and the control of the project is within Germany's control? President Biden, we will, I promise you, we will be able to do it. <laughs> the German chancellor is standing right there, okay? <laughs> they ask him and he, he's a master of circumlocution and evasiveness and he's, oh, we're great, we're great allies. But he's not, the Germans are up in arms about all this. You know, does Biden really think that he's king of, <laughs> king of Germany, for God's sake? Yes, he does. <laughs> so it's going to be really interesting to see if the Germans, after what, 75 plus years of servitude, of vassalship, if you will, uh, finally stand up on their hind legs and say, look, we got in economic interests here. Uh, we don't believe all this business about uh, Putin uh, invading Ukraine. So um, it's sort of academic on the one hand, but uh, please uh, don't put us in that kind of awkward position again. We'll see what happens. I've been telling my friends, don't hold your breath. Well, we've got a couple hands up, Ray. Uh, John Walsh and Don Kimball, then a question from Jim Walgamuth. And if you put up your electronic or other hands and I'll put you in line, folks. Go ahead, John. Uh, Ray, that was really a very interesting and, re and revealing discussion. Thanks very much. Thanks, but I, I, I noticed that uh, in, in, in all his responses, Biden 
seems to be making very clear, or as clear as he can, uh, that the United States will send support, send weapons, arms to uh, Ukraine and Europe, but not troops. He, he keeps saying U.S. He said in the New York Times today, he said U.S. troops will not fight Russian troops. So it sounds to me that he would be not adverse to a, a war with Europeans fighting Europeans. And uh, we just provide the, uh, the uh, means for them to knock each other out. I mean, that, I would, that's what I would conclude from that, from this. John, it really is bizarre, you know? We're gonna send troops where? To all the countries that aren't threatened even notionally by, by Russia. Are we gonna send troops to Ukraine? No, we're not gonna, that, no. Uh, are we going to evacuate US citizens using military planes? No, 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 says Biden last night because that could get us in a shooting war with Russia. And Russia has one of the biggest and the most effective armies. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get why they say all these things, except, you know, it's stream of consciousness on the part of, of Biden. And it's, you know, extremely embarrassing. Here's the US asking, as you say, the Europeans to be uh, really concerned about all this, but you're, then you're on your own and we'll do sanctions that will hurt you far more than will hurt us. I mean, it's the clowns running our diplomacy. The only hopeful sign uh, that I point to is that under the surface, there are talks about what really bothers Putin the most. And let's hope that those, those uh, intermediate range ballistic missile talks succeed. Thank you. Uh... Don Kimball from Maine has got his hand up, and then that followed by Alice Slater. Ray, thank you for the history of the Cold War. And I've got kind of three questions for you there, and take any of them that you want. One, how do nuclear, how do US nuclear submarines factor into all this? Because if they're in the Black Sea, I mean, they're as close as putting any Tomahawk missiles in, in Poland or other places. Two is how do hypersonic weapon development factor into all this? And three, you know, the Russians just killed a satellite with their, I don't know what kind of technology it is. And how does the space race, if you will, factor into all this strategy here? Thanks. Well, I think uh, in one word, it strengthens Putin's confidence. As you may have noticed in that clip I tried to play, uh, he's talking about measures that they took not building ABMs because they're not sure they work. Actually, they don't work. <laughs> not wasting money, as he put it, but building hypersonic weaponry. And now I think that it's very clear that they have the capability uh, to defeat any ABM system and to, uh, to retaliate for any, any uh, nuclear threat. So the... Uh, the, the nuclear submarines, the, the ones that uh, have nuclear, nuclear missiles on them, uh, they, can, they can fire those missiles from thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away. They don't, they don't need to be in the Black Sea. Uh, there are, uh, there are uh, the possibility of uh, the Tomahawk missiles, which are sea-based originally, uh, being used in the Black Sea. But, you know, they can be done from a standoff Point of view as well. The point is here that, that Putin has strengthened uh, Russia in a way that no one anticipated Russia could be strengthened, and now he's speaking from a uh, from a, from really high cards. And I I'm, I can't believe that I forgot to mention this, but the highest card he has is China. China, China and Russia are now in a virtual military alliance. Uh, they're not going to be pushed around by the U.S. And the prospect of a two-front war, uh, not even our crazy four stars are, are, are big fans of that. And, uh, you know, the President Xi from, from China has come through. And he said that the 
literally. He said that the strategic relationship between China and Russia exceeds in warmth and in effectiveness a traditional treaty. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot uh, because <laughs> here's, here's a rather humorous thing. Uh, the national security doctrine is being worked out right now in Washington and Putin is, re is, is responsible for impeding its work. Do you know why? Because China was our main opponent under the last one and now we don't know whether it should be Putin or, or China or, or both. And so we can't write this national security document. It's just report today, you know. So it's Putin's fault. You know, the idea that the US could say, well, we're going to take on both these, these major powers at the same time without them coalescing into what is an alliance right now um, is, is preposterous. But that's precisely what our preposterous policymakers have done. And that's the big new factor. And my point simply is, if I hadn't mentioned it before, that what gave Putin uh, the real ability to be so assertive at the end of last year was pure and simple China. And I'll just spend one, one more minute on this. In June, when Biden and uh, and Putin had their first actual face-to-face -face meeting in, in Geneva, the 16th of June. Uh, getting on the plane to, to leave Geneva, uh, Biden says, you know, uh, I, told, I told Putin, uh, we're aware of his problem. He's really in a box uh, uh, because China is squeezing him, squeezing him. And, and I told, well, I, I, it would be not right for me to say what I told him, but but uh, they have this long border, Russia and China, and China's about to become not only a major economic, but the military. Uh, so Putin's got a real problem here. Now, what's the point of that? Well, I don't know who told Biden that. That might've been true three decades ago. It's not true anymore. They're like this now. And so for the subsequent six months were spent by China and Russia, uh, trying to instruct Biden uh, that no, no, <laughs> we're not at, I'm not, nobody's squeezing one another. If it's a squeeze, it's an embrace, and it's all to your detriment, and it's all your fault. And that happens to be the reality. Okay, Alice Slater has a question. Hi, Alice. You got a, you're muted, Alice. I was going to say thanks, Ray, but I should have said I shouldn't have said thanks because I feel like I have the weight of the world on my shoulder, and I'm wondering: Is there any way for us to get this message out? I mean, the way we talk about the Mickey Mat, but can we be clever in getting it out? Because that speech between Russia and China—that's our nuclear posture review. They asked for everything we're asking in the nuclear posture review. I mean. Do people know this? Well, people, you know, I mean, how, you know, there's no report of their speech, just how terrible that they're ganging up on us, you know, but no report that they're like the wise elders that are saying, here's the way to go. And hmm. That's my question. Like in your travels around, do you see, like we used to have Dennis Kucinich, they redistricted him. We can't even get one person in Congress to say this. Is that true? Yeah. Well, what do you think? Alice, I share your frustration. Um, we work really hard uh, to get the, the word out and uh, yet uh, our voices uh, sound like the proverbial tree falling in the forest with no one to listen. Uh, I don't know how to crack this nut, but I do feel that a personal kind of approach might work. Uh, what I have in mind is uh, we know who heads up Raytheon. We know who heads up Lockheed Martin. We know the, the CEOs of all these places that are making 20, 10, only $5 million a year on warmongering and building things that don't even work. 
Uh, we're citizens as well as they are. Um, let me be very concrete. I was up at Columbia at the School of Journalism about three years ago, and uh, we were talking about the head of uh, Honeywell, who Honeywell makes the little gyrations or gyroscope for stuff that for the couple of those missiles, okay? And so somebody said, well, we know where the CEO of Honeywell lives in Morristown, New Jersey, just, just, a, just an hour away. Now, back in the day, <laughs> back in the 60s, there yeah. would be somebody saying, I've rented a bus. We're going out to Morristown, New Jersey on Saturday. We're going we're gonna to visit the head of, uh, of Westinghouse. And I looked around, there was nobody hiring any buses. There was nobody even thinking of hiring any buses. It was just that, well, he's making a lot of money out of, out of you know, war profiteering, but what can we do about it? So, you know, if I were, if I lived in Morristown, I would be right in front of his house with a picket and uh, I wouldn't let any cops deprive me of my right to be on his sidewalk. I say, this guy is gouging. This guy is spending money that should be going That's to good. the poor like country. So that's my only suggestion. It takes some guts. Now, um, I guess I haven't said this in a while, but we, uh, people of a certain age, not you, Ellis, but people <laughs> of age, okay, and Jerry, maybe, all right? I'm older than Bobby. <laughs> we, we, have a, we have a certain advantage, okay? Now, when uh, the, the organs of state security, as the Russians used to call them, beat up kids or adolescents or teenagers, I don't know, I don't know. they got that coming to them, you know. But when they beat up old people, it looked like this. Americans seem to care about old people. I mean, you don't beat up old people. So this is a real advantage that we have. What I'm saying is, you know, we ought to put it into play. If we get beat up, well, I've been beat up. Uh, you know, I'm still okay. Uh, chances are you'll survive, but Americans will say, well, why are they beating up old people? Well, it's because old people know what the score is and they're exposing, exposing the war profiteering that's going on here. So I think there is an avenue. It just takes a lot of guts and some organizing and some willingness to put your body into it. To get beat up. <laughs> yeah, beating up old veterans. Even worse. Thanks. By the way, there was a news story about how Raytheon, Lockheed, and... Uh, What's the third one? Boeing. They're like gleefully rubbing their hands at the thought of the profits they're going to make selling weapons to Ukraine. I mean, it was a shameless news story. It wasn't, they're not even hiding it, you know. So. Yeah, so we have a lot to work with. It's just that uh, somehow or other, I don't know. Well, I suppose it's the, the draft, among other things. Uh, when we had a draft, it was very, yeah, very that different. helped. But, so Herbert uh, Hoffman's got his hand up for a while. Go ahead, Herbert. Hi, Ray. How are you? Hi, Herbert. Good to see you. Yeah. Good seeing you, too. Uh, you haven't mentioned the role, though you mentioned the revolution in, uh, 20, uh, in 14, 2014. You didn't mention the role of the neo-Nazis, nor the neo-Nazis influence or control in Eastern Ukraine. And of course we know that Newland was sort of a friend of those people. Comment? Well, of course, uh, you know, the Russians uh, feel particularly strongly about Nazis uh, for reasons we all understand. 27 million. Some of these, uh, the, Az the Azov Battalion, for example, uh, you know, they openly display uh, flags that look very much like swastikas. Right. Uh, so where are these arms that the U.S. and others are sending the Ukrainians? Where are they going? Well, to the Azov Battalion? To other people who might uh, see some point in giving some Russians a bloody nose? Okay, that's the danger here. Right. Yeah, if they try to give some Russians or Russian speaking people in Donetsk or Lugansk, so bloody nose, uh, there will be retaliation. Now, maybe if, uh, if the Russians are really smart, uh, and they, they read uh, Biden uh, very closely, they won't send any people, troops, and they won't send any tanks. They'll just send 
missiles and, and decimate these people. That wouldn't be an invasion, would it? Well, don't count it out. That kind of interference, I think, is more likely than not. But hopefully the Russians have that part of Ukraine so penetrated with their intelligence services that they pretty much know what's coming and can probably nip such things in the bud. At least I hope that's the case. Thank you, Ray. Well, we covered a lot of ground here, and this is very uh, informative indeed. Um, and your suggestion that uh, people need to get off the couch and get into some direct action against the weapons manufacturers is something that some of us will wanna uh, think more about and take some action on. Um, I don't know if there's any other uh, questions. I'd like to invite uh, 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 the women here, Ellen Thomas, Nancy Price, Cheryl Spencer, Rachel Clark, uh, to have the final chance to ask a question or make a comment. And if you don't have anything, then we'll, we'll uh, okay, Rachel, please go ahead. And then, then Cheryl. Hi, Ray and everyone. Uh, it's been an amazing um, education, uh, educational opportunity for me to be a part of this meeting. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> this past December, uh, I organized the uh, uh, Parents for Peace uh, Peace Speaking Tour via Zoom. And uh, one of our guest speakers was um, um, Matt Ho. And uh, in his talk, he mentioned about how under the umbrella of Pentagon, um, those, how do you say, military divisions, Army, Navy, um, Air Force and um, <clears throat> Marine Corps and now Space, Space Force. Uh, they are fight, trying to be a, how to say, main power of different wars. Right. Uh, whereas the, uh, in the Middle East, it was very difficult for those uh, multiple branches of military to coordinate, right? So it seems like uh, by uh, retrieving out from the uh, um, Afghanistan, let the Afghanistan war, like other clandestine um, wars, like other parts of Africa and the Middle East, right? At least he said that there was at least 15 ongoing uh, secret war uh, operated by CIA's military version, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if they could concentrate on Russia, China, Russia could be main stage for army, right? That will, having Russia as an enemy, uh, it will allows us to, uh, allows army to get the big budget for new type of, of, of tanks and all, you know, army center, centered equipments. Whereas the China, having a China as an enemy, it's a Navy's main, uh, Navy and Marine Corps' main playground so that they can get the much bigger budget officially uh, in order to purchase new aircraft carriers and all the system, right? So uh, the, when I heard this story, it really cleared up my mind because I, I thought it was very dangerous for the United States to fight uh, both with Russia and China but actually it's opened up the stage for army and Navy. And, but as a result, like you said before, actually it ignited much bigger coalition between Russia and China. So I'm very curious what this story may develop in the future. What is your take? Uh, well, thank you, Rachel. That, that's a really good question. This mm -hmm. is really the, the quintessential question strategically. <laughs> In, in the world. Um, Russia and China are not natural partners. Uh, my first job at the CIA was uh, assessing uh, Soviet foreign policy toward China. And in, in those years, I'm talking the 60s and 70s, they hated each other. They hated each other, it was really, really bad. And we were convinced, we very smart analysts, they would hate each other forever. <laughs> they had Irredenta. They had Chinese claim major parts of Russia. A hundred, what? It was a, 
a thousand and a half square kilometers in in Siberia, China claimed Russia seized under unequal treaties in the 17th century. And was that true? Yes, that was true. Okay. They came to border skirmishes in 1969. So we were convinced they would hit each other forever. And Nixon took advantage of this enmity to put pressure on Russia to come to those agreements that I mentioned before, including the first, uh, the first SALT agreement. So gradually, uh, more moderate leaderships took over in both Moscow and Beijing, and they saw how debilitating it was to be fighting each other all the time, and what an advantage it gave to the US, and they started coming together. And we warned, uh, I personally warned Secretary Schultz that this is, this was after I, after I left my briefing job, uh, he asked me to stay in touch with him. But as it became clear that they weren't going to hate each other forever, we thought we really ought to tell policymakers. And uh, Schultz put a, a task force together to see how far they could go. Well, no one expected that they would go from $200 million a year trade turnover to $200 billion dollars a year trade turnover. And that's what we expect within the next two years with this new pipeline going from Sahalin. Okay. So, you know, my computer doesn't allow me to figure out how many times 200 million, 200 billion is, but, <laughs> but it's a lot. And it's characteristic of what's happened here. Now, when the US and its wisdom says, ah, China's our main enemy now, China's what we have to compete with, uh, the, the Chinese say, you know, zero sum is the way you guys approach the world. But what can we talk about this? Why does it have to be zero sum? Why does it have to be you or me? The Chinese say that, okay? <laughs> Makes a lot of sense to me, you know? Uh, and, and, uh, and the, the Russians and the Chinese say, well, you know, it looks like uh, we're both main enemies. Uh, why don't we see if we can uh, face up to this thing together? Now, the Chinese have endorsed Russia core interests, including endorsing the negotiations on intermediate range ballistic missiles specifically in that joint statement when, when Putin was uh, there to start to inaugurate the Olympics. So it's really getting quite clear for even the, the, the dummies that advise Biden that this is something to contend with. And as I said before, this is the major new factor and it accounts in large measure, in my view, for why Putin is being so assertive now, why Lavrov can put the British foreign secretary down, uh, why they can make fun of, uh, of Zelensky. Uh, just a little anecdote here. Lavrov was talking about Zelensky. Zelensky is, of course, the president of, of, uh, of Ukraine. And uh, it came up, somebody referred to Zelensky, and Lavrov says, oh, Zelensky, yeah. he's also a piano player. Now, what's that all about? Anybody know? <laughs> His claim to fame as a comedian in Ukraine was playing a duet on the piano. Who was the partner? Zelensky's private parts was the other member of this duet. I don't know. How, I, I haven't seen it, but I, I'm, I'm told it's <laughs> quite something. It's extremely laughable, but here's Lavrov making fun of this. Oh yeah, he plays the piano. So you know, they're feeling much more confident and much more willing to be undiplomatic than I've seen the Russians in decades. And I think it has to do with the fact that they know China's at their back. They know they've scared Biden, not only by the troops around Ukraine, but by enlisting China in, in support of Russia. So uh, they're filling their oats and I don't expect anything to happen until there's something that can be characterized as a mutually beneficial 
a mutually advantageous agreement. And I think the best candidate for that is uh, the INF, the uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear that, Forces. That would be a good outcome. Uh, Nancy Price, you're gonna get the last question here, I think. Oh dear. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a fascinating update. Um, well, very quickly, uh, I suppose Putin has concerns about the 2030 update of NATO's modernization of, of uh, their uh, weaponry. And, and second, what, what's the danger of armed drones uh, in the hands of a variety of people uh, in the area there, including Ukraine and, and uh, bordering countries? Well, I don't know what to say to that. The armed drones are, are a real problem. Um, actually, one of them was used uh, in Ukraine, um, a Turkish one. Uh, 20, you say 2020 uh, or 2030? 2030. Yeah. I, you know, I, I hope to be around 2030, but I don't think in those longer terms. Uh, I'm thinking about this year and next, and I think uh, Putin is focused in, in that way as well. Um, you know, hopefully someone will hit the Germans and, and the French up about the head and say, look, you know, this is all unnecessary. Do you think the Russians are going to invade France or, or Germany? Do you think they really think that? What made you think that? Oh, you don't think? Oh. Well, let's reduce our defense. Let's get together and negotiate a, neg a, a reduction in arms expenses and arms. Right, right, right. So the zero sum thing you know, that the Chinese uh, often raise is just humanly reasonable. Why is it that after we screwed up and decided to ostracize Russia rather than enlist them in a in, in a movement, in a world that right. George H.W. Bush talked about, uh, a, a world free and complete from Portugal to Vladivostok, uh, why, we, why we can't say, okay, that was a big mistake excluding the Russians. Let's talk to them now. Let's see if we can work out some deals. So a lot of the money that we're spending can be put to God, the, the, the things that we need to do and not only for the pandemic, but for other basic human needs. Right, right. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ken Mayers, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Ken is one of the primary authors of the Veterans Peace Nuclear Posture Review, and he's been uh, very quiet so far today. Uh, I wanted to give him a chance to make a comment here. <laughs> I tend to be quiet around Brother Ray because he's so knowledgeable and uh, he and I like to trade jokes instead of uh, serious dialogue most of the time. But I will say this, uh, relative to the question of looking forward to 2030, uh, and I just had my 85th birthday on Saturday, and so uh, I'm not counting on it, but I'm hoping for it. Uh, it seems to me by 2030, the climate crisis will have gotten so great that our national leaders are gonna finally have to become sane enough to say, this is bigger than both of us. This is bigger than all of us. We gotta put away our toys and start working on the real issues. Amen to that. That's what Amen. And I hope that works out that way. Uh, we've got a ways to go before people become that reasonable. And I think the Mickey mat is the main impediment. Okay, those are good, strong final words here. Thank you so much, Ray. This has really been great. Uh, we're going to move on. Yes, everybody give a big applause to Ray. <laughs> Thank you. It was fabulous. Um, Thank you. All the rest of you, too. Great questions, good discussion. Uh, we're going to move on to the next part of our meeting, which is uh, an abbreviated uh, business meeting where we have a few things to discuss, including uh, presentation that several of us will be making tomorrow um, uh, on the Veterans for Peace Nuclear Posture Review as a webinar that's uh, co-hosted 
and co-sponsored by Veterans for Peace and Massachusetts Peace Action. Um, and everybody who's here just to hear Ray, you're welcome to stay or you're welcome to go. Um, and uh, we have a, we also want to do a little bit of, uh, have a little bit of discussion about next steps for how we can effectively utilize our uh, nuclear posture review. Um, so uh, we're going to jump into that. Uh, Ken, would you maybe uh, take take us through the plan for tomorrow and uh, as, as well as the um, uh, prioritizing what we want 